Thank you, Tim. Uh, how good is it to finally get up here after a very extended Nuffield scholarship? I take my hat off to the 2020 scholars here today and have presented that had another year in limbo. Presentations have been fantastic. I'm only standing here reflecting the support of so many people, and there's many thanks to you. To Nuffield Australia and the state committees, particularly Tasmania, and to the Nuffield alumni, thank you for welcoming me into the Nuffield family. I feel very privileged. To Jody and Nicola for the efforts that you took to keep us engaged through the year of Zoom in 2021 and then to get us all moving again. It's an amazing effort to get so many people around the world with so few hiccups. To my sponsors, the Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture and the J.M. Roberts Trust, thanks for your support, not just of me, but of agriculture. We need more support for if agriculture is to be recognised for the importance it plays in our lives. Um, I think Nuffield asked a lot of our, of not just the scholars, but our families, probably more so. And so to my wife, Sally, and Ollie, Joe and Amy, who've made the trip over from Tassie, thanks for your love and support and the freedom to go and make the most of that opportunity. I couldn't have done it without you. And to our team at home, I'm really lucky that we've got a great team of people working in our business. They kept the wheels turning and the right things happening at the right time. And to my fellow scholars, I think one of the highlights of the trip was the GFP and just bouncing ideas around. That's what Nuffields, to me, is all about. I'm the owner manager of Glenelg Estate, a long-term family business in southern Tasmania. Uh, we run approximately 15,000 merino sheep, fine wool, 350 Angus cattle. Uh, we have some agroforestry. Uh, most of our native forests now manage for carbon trading rather than timber. And due to our very dry and unreliable climate in 2016, we put in our first 20 hectare vineyard, which is shortly going to be 35 hectares presenting some challenges in finding staff, hence being up here today. We, our team is so important to our business, but very few from a back end in agriculture. Hugo, our vineyard manager, is a former teacher. Eva is a former product manager with Kmart. Louise is in her first job out of school. Viv's a former tree faller. Alice is a former chef. And we only have one person who has a more traditional background in doing a bit of casual work around the traps and landmarking and then coming to work for us. My grandfather began a list of all the people that worked in our business in the 1940s. My dad continued it, and we still have that list going today. That's the start of it, and my grandfather's, and we've had approximately 90 people come through our business in the last 80 years. I would discount that first line of 1935. He was only nine at the time. So, hands, you wouldn't like that data. The reliability of it's poor. <laughs> Interestingly, my, we also record where people have gone to, and my dad had someone leave to go to jail, Another leave to later become a member of parliament in Tasmania representing the Greens. And in my tenure, we had a young bloke doing an apprenticeship by the name of Nick Wolf, who now with his brother and two friends is the band The Wolf Brothers, playing professionally. We need to keep investing in, our, in technology to drive down cost of production, improve efficiencies and improve yield. But often the more technology we put in our business, the more complex our business has become and the harder it is to find staff. Catherine mentioned that unprecedented demand for our graduates. I pulled a couple of headlines up from articles that I've read over the past year or so. When I got pushed to apply for a scholarship and I was thinking about what to, talk, what to look at, I had the idea of looking at how do we implement technology in our businesses after utter frustration in trying to get reliable capture of data in our, for our genetic program in our sheep flock. I felt like every time I'd set something up in the shearing shed, everyone would be good, I'd turn my back and walk away and it would not work and my staff were just ready to throw it back at me. After the CSC last year, I stayed with another Nuffield scholar, Matt Blythe, who works in the area of precision livestock and data management. His business is increasingly providing support, uh, filling the void that manufacturers have left in that space for people buying this, these products and he said to me that if something's not supported properly and you don't teach people to use it, it gets thrown over the hedge and doesn't come back. That was our experience. I'd discuss my thoughts with people around me constantly and often I'd get the comment, oh, you spend all this time training somebody and they leave, why would you bother? And by the time I got my application done, it was more about how do we teach complex skills to people so that we can get people up and running as quickly as possible. Technology is a tool and with, for millennia, people have learned to use all sorts of tools. Under the most recent award rate, 
a level one station hand with no experience, if you include super and works comps, paid $34 an hour without housing or any other benefits. That's over $1,300 a week. That can be a good investment or a waste of money, depending on how they come into your business. Problem of a lack of people wanting to work in agriculture was common to the more developed countries I visited around the world. Each relied on migrants from the poorer countries to supplement the bulk agriculture workforce. In England and Germany, their supply was Eastern Europe. In Ontario, Canada, they relied on a program from Jamaica for the horticultural workforce. In the US, it's Mexico. And in Australia and New Zealand, the Pacific Islands. Along with more transient, more casualised people, we've had a approximately 60% reduction in the number of people from 15 to 24 years old working in agriculture in the last 20 years. That's a lot of skills and just exposure to agriculture at an early age that we then have to reproduce in our businesses when these people come to work for us. Alongside that, the demographic trends for people to have far more career mobility over their lifetimes. So I think we have to get used to the fact that if people come in, they're maybe not going to stay for a long time. I often ask people at businesses I visited through Nuffield that have increasingly employed technology, have you found it more difficult to get staff? And the answer was always, it's harder to get skilled staff as opposed to staff generally. There was a gap there. This is one of the most impressive businesses I've visited with Nuffield, the Volgamore Family Farms in Kansas, US. Over the past 20 years or so, they've gone from 12,000 acres to 90,000 acres of crop, scoped to employ multiple family members. There were a couple of cases when we visited of first and second generation employees working in the business together. And the owners were committed to the education of staff. They actively encouraged and sponsored their team members to attend university. And then those skills were then transferable to their training. They had the scale, of course, they were employing a lot of people, but with seasonal workers, the cost and the time involved in training could spread but be between multiple field managers who were well-skilled. We stayed with them on our GFP overnight. Their central complex was all one building, their workshop, meeting rooms, boardroom, an apartment, and one central kitchen. And walking into that kitchen to me with their staff was like walking into a happy family home. It was, I've never experienced it in a workforce before. And that's something that we are trying to replicate in our much smaller business. The owners left after about half an hour and we spent more time with the operations managers than we did with the owners themselves. Most of the most, one of the most important features of the Volgamore business was their scale. That's their chemical batching plant behind us on that slide. Not, you don't see very many like that. Not in Tasmania anyway. But having, an, as I said, a number of well-educated skills people um, having scale mode training far more easy, easier. Another business that I saw at a smaller scale but increasing the, their reach was Overland Farms in Canterbury, UK. Uh, it's run by Henry Miles. He's built his business on the back of servicing greenhouses primarily for one Dutch client and now looks after the clean out between crops and tidy up of around 50 hectares of glass. A massive business. He relies on casuals from Poland primarily. The seasonality and continued loss of casual staff and then having to retrain him made him look for more avenues to keep staff employed. So he's begun trying to pull a growth medium out of those greenhouses, recycle it, turn it into potting mix. I was unfortunately there between, while well, the crops were still growing, so there wasn't as much activity as normal. The two slides show the, the pile of bags of coir on one side, and then his screening plant and potting mix coming out on the other side, sold to our equivalent of Bunnings. For him, again, scale, and then consistency of work made the difference between retention of the skills and the time involved in training or losing it. In a complete contrast overseas, the Van Shake Dairy in Ontario, Canada. This was a much smaller business and they had continually battled with staff. Uh, I visited them with our family at the end of the GFP, so the kids thought the robots were fascinating. The one on the left is the milking machine and the one on the right is a machine just to push feedback across to the cows. They put a robotic dairy in because they just couldn't find staff and had really struggled to find, retain, train and retain people. The only employee was their son who was well educated and could maintain and uh, look after the complex technology employed in that business. However, they couldn't expand easily because of the cost and availability of milk and cow quieter in Canada. That was their constraint, more so than land. When I was bouncing ideas around with other Nuffield scholars, 
I was chatting to a 2021 scholar in the UK, Camilla Hazelden Ashby, who works for a farm software company called Field Margin. I was talking to her about how do you make technology usable so that people can pick it up and, and run with it with no hassles. She told me to read that book, The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. It's a Bible of design students. And that book introduced to me the conceptual or the mental model, which is a representation in someone's mind of how something works. I found it really interesting in Nick's talk where he was talking about the, the sales pitch to new entrants in the northern cattle industry compared to the reality of another 10,000 calves to go after the first one. If we're going to train somebody and bring them into our businesses with no exposure in agriculture, we need to understand our mental models and what another person's might be. Um, a second idea came from our host from the Kansas USA GFP League, Russell Plachka. Prior to his current role with the US Depa sorry, Kansas Department of Agriculture, he worked in education and said that education relies on teaching graduated skills with each level of creating a foundation for the next, and then said to me, have you ever thought about what you do every day in your business? What's a level one skill for you? And then said, for someone who's never been on a farm before, a level one skill might be as simple as opening a gate. That was a Google search for farm gate latches. You can see what Russell's getting at. Hmm? I'll refer back to the slide I said where there's 60% less people from 15 to 24 year olds working in agriculture. And I suspect the problem's earlier than that. Um, there's less people working or living in rural communities and they're not growing up with the, some exposure to agriculture. I look at my kids sitting over there and f kids of my friends who have grown up around farms. By the time they're 12, they can help in the yards with sheep and not get in the way. And that just comes from exposure. So I think our mental models is partly experience. And we, as employers, if we're bringing new people in, we have to replace that. The existing vocational training system in agriculture provides a national curriculum designed to ensure trainees have consistent skills at completion. However, very important however, if someone's at TAFE, they're probably at your business for 44 weeks a year and maybe at TAFE for four. So it relies on our skill, our ability to teach those practical skills at completion. Our trainee Louise, through her TAFE course, she's done a course that says she can use a chainsaw, box ticks. Pete, who's been with us for years, I think he was using a chainsaw before a knife and fork as a kid. We had to send Louise out with him and say, Pete, make sure that she can use a chainsaw. Don't leave it up to TAFE because I'm not confident in their ability to teach those practical skills to the point where people are not going to get hurt. This is a similar system to vocational training around the world. Skilled employees need that right environment to get there. And as employers, we have to provide it. There's four basic methods of learning. I'll come back to that photo in a minute. Fluent reading and writing. Watching, listening, and doing. Those sheep learn by watching. One of the rat bags up there found a hole in the fence to get up on top of that building. It is built into the side of the hill, so it's not as hard as it looks. And the others all followed. And thankfully, they went back in the same direction. <laughs> if we want to learn how to teach people and get our ideas across, we need to understand how people learn. That is out of the instructions for the card game Exploding Kittens, which was given to my seven-year-old daughter for her birthday a couple of weeks ago. In Australia, hang on, I'll let you read that. In Australia, the education levels of our workforce in agriculture, um, we've got 55% of our workforce has no post-secondary education compared to 33% of the general population. Giving someone a pile of written material and asking them and expecting to read it and take it in is probably not going to work. Really great example in our business, a few years ago, um, we'd bought a 20 tonne excavator and Pete, who's an excellent machinery driver, managed to get caught on a rock down in a hole and pop the track off. If I gave him a book and explanation about how to read to get the track back on, it would never have worked. Unfortunately, he had a poor education experience and struggles with reading and writing. So we got out of the hole, ducked up on a hill where we had phone service and got YouTube out and type it in, how to get a, 20, a track back on a 20-ton excavator. And sure enough, there was a video for it. We watched that. Three hours later, we're away again, going, all happy. But providing that material in the right format, absolutely critical. <laughs> so what I've learned, casualised and transient workforce is normal in developed countries. We're more likely to be employing people for a short time. And the likelihood is they'll have no exposure to agriculture when they start with us. They may not stay for long. We need people. 
no matter how good the technology gets, there's a lot of jobs on farming that we can't do. I actually thought maybe 10 years ago that shearing would be an alternative to shearing, but the more books I read about technology, the more I talk to people, I just, I can't see us getting there. Not for any time soon. Every sheep's almost the same, but it's not quite. Skilled employers, employees need us to teach those skills, and we need to understand how to do that. And we need to do it as quickly as possible because every day that someone's there, they're not learning, that's a day wasted, that's a cost to our business. And scale is really important. From what I saw around the world, that was the number one factor that separated the businesses that had the capacity to teach from those that didn't. So what are we doing in our business? We are asking ourselves the question Russell asked me, what are those basic skills that someone needs to be productive for us. What does day one look like if someone starts in our business? For me, one of the big ones in our livestock side of it is geography. That's our farm map. There's not many square paddocks and there's a lot of them because of our topography. If someone knows our property geographically, I can say to them, can you go out to that paddock, open the gate into the next one, check the water while you're there and I can have confidence it's done. If they don't know that, they're just tagging along with somebody else, and that's not a good way to spend anyone's time. And those skills, can we clearly demonstrate them and provide support to people to learn them in the correct format? Um, for us, we have, do have a written operations manual. I got a lot out of it when I did it 20 years ago just to clear my thinking, but it's, as a training tool, it's useless. I think we need to be moving towards more video references, more demonstrations and provide those to people so that they've got them on their phones all the time. Everyone has their phone with them all of the time. Can we increase our scale? Oh, sorry, too quickly. Um, not geographically, I don't think, but we have been able to do that by putting our vineyard in. Um, we've got another 20 hectares surveyed after our current planning's in, and in a couple of years' time when we see some cash flow back, we'll look to move again. And collaboration, it's been a bit of a theme for the last couple of days. Uh, we've got a friend who grows strawberry runners and his peak periods don't overlap with ours. So we think there's some opportunities there to hopefully share some work between us, keep people employed and not lose that training once we've gone through it. So that is the end for me. My report has far more information in it. You can read it, but only if you're someone who learns by reading. If not, please catch up with me before the end of the conference. And thank you. <laughs>